I've been bugged into Facebook. I haven't bugged into Facebook. I have password every time. Just keep doing it. You just log in. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Alright, you can turn on Messenger. So you can leave that one, I think. And that's that. And then this one, that's like that. And to change it, I just do that. Yeah. And hopefully it works. Uh, you can join the class very soon. Uh, I'm just hoping it shows that screen. Hey! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right, guys. Hi. We might we might start. I'm Yale. I'm a fourth year on GP at the moment. Um, and as you all know, we'll be doing the upper GI revision today. So just a quick rundown of how the lecture is going to go. We'll start off with um, esophageal conditions, then we'll do gastric conditions, biliary, and a bit of hepatic. Um, and after that, we'll have a little bit of an approach to OSCE, so dysphagia, hemoptysis, nausea, vomiting. Um, and then obviously, we'll do a couple of multiple choice questions. So I just want to draw your attention to that marking scheme, which was actually our end of year, year three exam. Um, and as you can see, the gastrointestinal and hepatobiliary has 23 marks. Um, there's a significant proportion of the marks that are directed towards gastro. So towards the end of the year, if you're trying to do cost-benefit analysis for what you should study, mm -hmm. the answer is, is gastro. <laughs> Um, we'll start off with some of the basics. I'm a huge fan in going over the pathophysiology of a disease before you actually learn it. I know you do it in first and second year, but it's good to do a quick refresher. So I know you guys know most of it, but we'll just go over some basics. Um, there's the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. Um, know the different vasculature and the different distributions. So just the celiac artery for the foregut, the SMA for the midgut, and the IMA for the hindgut. And also feel free to butt in with any questions if you guys have throughout the presentation. Um, and while we're on vasculature, just to note, um, there's dual blood supply to the liver. The liver is probably the most complicated blood supply in the GIT system. Um, there's the portal vein and there's the hepatic artery. So the portal vein is what carries the nutrient-rich blood from the intestines to the liver. Um, and the reason why this is important is because in cirrhosis, there's anastomoses between the portal veins and the systemic veins. And if you increase portal vein pressure, um, you end up increasing pressure in the systemic veins and then you get um, varices. So does anyone know the three places where you'll get varices? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Exactly. Um, all right. So if the server changes. Um, okay, so we'll go through some of the neuronal regulation of the gut. Um, the different layers of the gut wall and the pathology will be heavily covered in your pathology lectures. So I'm not going to labour the point too much. But just know the difference between the submucosal and the myenteric um, plexus. So the submucosal is between the muscularis mucosa and the muscularis propria. Um, and because it's in that layer, it's going to be responsible for stimulating digestion. Um, you've also got the myenteric plexus, which is between the inner circular and the outer longitudinal layers. And because it's between the two muscular layers, you can obviously assume that it will be responsible for peristalsis and stimulating and inhibiting contraction of the sphincter muscles. Um, clinical note, uh, the pathophysiology of achalasia, which we'll talk through when we go through the esophageal conditions, is related to the neuronal control. So you'll have damage to the myenteric plexus. We know the myenteric plexus controls the peristalsis. So if you damage that, that's when you get achalasia. Um, quick anatomy revision of the esophagus. It's a muscular tube. There's two sphincters. There's a functional sphincter and an anatomical sphincter. Um, and know the difference, again, you'll learn this again in pathology, but know the difference between the upper third and lower two thirds. 
So the upper third of the esophagus is striated muscle, so it's under voluntary control. The lower two thirds um, is smooth muscle, so it's involuntary control. Um, and it's lined by a stratified squamous epithelium which is different to the epithelium of the stomach. And this will become important when we talk about Barrett's esophagus. Uh, also a number of different constrictions of the esophagus um, and they relate to the different anatomical landmarks. So try to commit those different constrictions to memory because it's an easy question that they can ask you guys. Um, okay, so this slide's a little bit content heavy. The reason why I put so much information on it was because um, the good thing about revision lectures is you can watch them the week before the exam when you've forgotten all your gastrointestinal stuff from the beginning of the year. And I want you to have a good resource that you can just look at and get a lot of information from. So gastroesophageal reflux disease is one of those conditions that you kind of have to know back to front. Um, it's really interesting because it can come up in an osteo under cough, it can come up under chest pain, it can come up under esophageal problems or dysphagia. So it really does sort of fit into every system. It's a, it's a masquerader of sorts. So what it is is inappropriate reflux of gastric content, especially acid aborally, which means towards the mouth. Um, and there's different reasons why this can occur. Most commonly, there's um, relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So you open the lower esophageal sphincter, acid comes up into the esophagus where it shouldn't be. Um, you can also get it in scleroderma. Have any of you guys come across scleroderma yet? Yeah? You'll talk about it more in rheumatology, but it is important to consider when you're thinking about esophageal conditions. Um, zollinger ellenson syndrome, does anyone know what that is? So that's really rare. It's more of a multiple choice question as opposed to something that you're going to see <laughs> in clinical practice, but it's sort of a tumour that produces too much acid. Um, and hiatus hernia. Do you guys know what hiatus hernias are? Yeah, cool. So those are some of the risk factors. History of presenting complaint, I like to split it up into reflux symptoms and respiratory symptoms. So reflux, heartburn, belching, retrosternal burning, um, respiratory wheeze, cough, aspiration, pneumonia. And I actually had a patient last week in general practice who came in complaining of a sore throat for a couple of weeks and it turns out they had gourd. So something to think about when you have sore throat or something to think about when you have chronic cough or that kind of thing. Investigations, it's usually clinical. What, what we do normally is we give patients a proton pump inhibitor and most will get better. Um, on a multiple choice question, the gold standard is 24 hour esophageal pH monitoring, but I don't think patients will like it too much if you stick a tube down their nose every time you think they got reflux. So that's not really done. Um, other things to consider, gastroscopy and esophageal manometry. Um, we usually manage with a PPI and on demand things, antacids, so things like Mylanta or Quickies. Um, and obviously, if you don't mention lifestyle things in a GERD station, then you guys will lose a lot of marks. Things like weight loss, control your alcohol intake, caffeine, don't eat just before you go to bed, that kind of thing. Um, and has anyone seen a Nissen fund application? So it's, a, it's sort of like a last line treatment for gourd, usually done when they have a hiatus hernia. They essentially wrap part of the stomach around the lower part of the esophagus, tightening the sphincter. Um, and that's really, uh, it's not commonly done, but it's a sort of last line treatment for gourd that's not really responding to PBIs. Um, and again, those are just some of the complications. Any questions about gourd? Oh, good. Okay. So absolutely have to commit this slide to memory because Barrett's esophagus, you are very likely to get a question on either in pathology exam or your multiple choice exam. In fact, you're almost certain to get quizzed on this at some stage. Um, it's metaplasia of the normal squamous epithelium to columnar epithelium. So it's a reaction of the esophagus to acid that shouldn't be there. Um, it undergoes metaplasia to compensate for that. And we worry about it because it's got a high risk of malignancy. So 30 to 60% transformation rate of over 10 years. Also important to know that 25% of patients with Barrett's won't actually have symptoms of reflux. Um, treat with PPI and surveillance, regularly doing gastroscopies to make sure there's no malignant transformation. Um, okay, so we'll talk about some esophageal motility disorders. Um, there are many more, but here are three that you kind of need to know. Achalasia, scleroderma, and diffuse esophageal spasm. So um, does anyone know the buzzwords for achalasia? No. All right. Well, you will know it by the end of this slide. Um, we'll talk about achalasia first. It's a failure of the smooth muscle relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. We spoke about it before when we were talking about the neuronal control of the esophagus. It's usually idiopathic, occasionally can be caused by cancer. 
Um, and we diagnose, if we do a chest x-ray, we might see no air in the stomach. We might see a dilated esophagus. Um, and if you look below, that's sort of what it's going to look like on barium swallow. You see a dilated esophagus with a narrowing portion towards the end. Um, we treat it with a balloon. Um, or we can use prophylaxis like PPIs and injection of Botox into the sphincter is sort of a last line. Um, scleroderma, I'm not going to labour the point too much because we'll talk about it in rheumatology. But does anyone know the acronym for scleroderma, some of the symptoms that you'll get? Correct. Yeah, awesome. Do you know what it stands for? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Um, so that can also give um, esophageal. <laughs> it will come up in one second. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second for everyone that didn't hear. And the last one, a diffuse esophageal spasm. Um, that's what it looks like on barium swallow. Different parts of the esophagus just spasm. Um, it's idiopathic um, and you get a corkscrew pattern on a manometry. So that's what it looks like. So here are the buzzwords. The buzzwords for achalasia, if you see bird's beak or rat's tail, um, you can almost pick achalasia without reading the rest of the question, but I still advise you to read the rest of the question. <coughs> Crest is calcinosis, Raynaud's esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. And diffuse esophageal spasm has that coarse through esophagus. So those are the buzzwords to look for on a multiple choice question. Um, this one I don't expect any of you guys to know, but it's a good thing to pick up again for multiple choice. Um, if a patient has dysphagia, they've got chest pain from esophageal dissension, um, they've got aspiration pneumonia, um, but they've also got recent travel and a toxic megacolon. So it sounds like achalasia, but there's also travel and toxic megacolon. So there's something else going on there. Can anyone hazard a guess what's happening here? Don't worry, this is a bit hard. Um, it's Chagas disease. It's caused by a parasite found in South America. And it's the same sort of pathophysiology of achalasia, but it also affects the colon. So that's why you get toxic megacolon, which is, as you can see in the x-ray up there, there's sort of really distended loops of bowel um, at high risk of perforation. So it's a surgical emergency or, or it needs to be seen. You need to be seen by a surgeon if you have toxic megacolon. Any questions so far? Cool. Okay. Um, okay, so toxic megacolon is when there's a, it commonly occurs in a disease called Hirschsprung's disease. You can also get it in ulcerative colitis. Hirschsprung's disease is something that you're born with. It's a um, congenital disease. And it essentially means that there's a, um, a problem with the neuronal control of the gut. So it can't sort of, contract normally. There's often massive dilation um, and there's a risk of perforation in toxic megacolon. So the main time when you see toxic megacolon or commonly is in Hirschsprung's disease and ulcerative colitis. Is there any other times when you get toxic megacolon? Yeah, no, those, those are the main two, um, which you'll probably see more when you do peas next year. So don't stress too much. No, it's actually a good question. I'm not entirely sure. I suspect, as in obviously, if there is perforation and you've got faecal matter in the um, abdomen, then it's pretty toxic. I'm not 100% sure of the exact reason. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, esophageal cancer, there's two types and, and know the distinction and the difference between the two. So there's squamous cell and there's adeno. Again, this is kind of covered in pathology. Um, but squamous cell is what's going to happen in the upper part of the esophagus and adenocarcinoma happens in the lower part. That's not a hard and fast rule, but for multiple choice purposes it is. Um, and adenocarcinoma is associated with Barrett's esophagus. So that's when you get the metaplasia and over time you've got inflammation and epithelial change and then you can get an adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell happens in the upper part and that's obviously more associated with tobacco and alcohol. Um, and again, with any cancer, so you'll have progressive and unrelating dis unrelenting dysphagia, starting with difficulty swallowing solids, but then progressing to liquids. And with any cancer, if they have the systemic symptoms like um, fever, night sweats, weight loss, that's also red flag for malignancy. Um, I'm not going to labour the anatomy of the stomach too much, 
Just have a look over this slide if you want to revise or however you like to revise anatomy. But we'll move on to gastritis. So I like to think of gastritis in terms of acute gastritis and chronic gastritis. Overwhelmingly, the cause everyone thinks of is H. pylori causing gastritis, helicobacter pylori. But there's other things that can cause or sort of um, worsen gastritis. So alcohol, aspirin and NSAIDs, shock. Um, physiological stress, really important. A lot of patients in ICU, the body is under such intense stress that they can develop gastritis. And many patients you'll see in ICU are actually on a PPI prophylaxis um, to prevent this, even without sort of symptoms of gastritis previously. Um, and chronic is obviously H. pylori, um, chemicals, radiation, celiac disease can cause a lymphocytic gastritis, um, non-infectious granulomatous gastritis, so Crohn's disease and sarcoidosis, um, and infectious gastritis. So the other one to know is autoimmune gastritis, also known as atrophic gastritis, and then that's inflammation of the gastric mucosa, which leads to destruction of um, the glandular cells and decreased secretion of some of the um, products. So does anyone know what we worry about? What are some complications or what are some things that we worry about in a patient with autoimmune gastritis? Yeah, good. Can anyone think of anything else that we'd want to worry about? Yeah, good. Yeah, well, I'm oh, sorry, I went backwards. Um, this is what we worry for B12 deficiency, again, because um, the production of intrinsic factor is sort of um, tampered with. We worry about gastric carcinoma. Quick rule of thumb, any time when you've got a process that's causing chronic inflammation in any particular part of the body, that's a risk factor for malignancy. So any time you see chronic inflammation anywhere, you have to worry about it developing into a cancer. Um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, so with autoimmune diseases, there's often a, if you've got one, you're often at increased risk of getting another. So there is an increased risk of Hashimoto's. Um, and don't worry about the last one, it's pretty uncommon. Uh, peptic ulcer disease is highly examinable and something you need to know quite well. So the definition is a break in the superficial epithelial cells penetrating into the muscularis mucosa. Um, and the thing that you'll see in exams is pointing signs. So often patients with abdominal pain will sort of say, oh, it kind of hurts around here or just this general area. But often with peptic ulcer disease, patients will say it hurts right here and they'll be able to point to the exact location of the pain. Um, the other things they might get is melina, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, anorexia. Um, the way we look for H. pylori is you can do a urea breath test bedside. I've never actually seen that being done, but supposedly it's something you can do. Um, bloods, you do an FB looking for anemia, but if it's an acute bleed, they might not be anemic at that stage. It sometimes takes a, a while to, before you can become properly anemic. Um, imaging, gastroscopy, obviously, can diagnose peptic ulcer disease. And there are also newer tests. So there's a fecal antigen and there's H. pylori serology. Um, and rarely, if you're thinking of Zollinger Ellenson syndrome, you can do a fasting serum gastrin level. But again, that's more for multiple choice purposes as opposed to things that you'll commonly see on the ward. Um, and I've highlighted the triple therapy and the quadruple therapy in blue because it's really examinable. It's, easy, it's an easy multiple choice question. So know the acronym ACE, amoxicillin, esomeprazole and clarithromycin for management of peptic ulcer disease or quadruple therapy. So um, bismuth, tetracycline, metronidazole and esomeprazole. So esomeprazole is the PPI, um, amoxicillin and clarithromycin are obviously <coughs> antibiotics. Um, any questions? And the other thing we want to know is the difference between gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers. So duodenal ulcers are the more common one. Um, gastric ulcers occur with NSAID use. Obviously, that makes <coughs> logical sense because um, NSAIDs go into our stomach. Um, and the, the key difference is uh, the relationship to eating and to food. So gastric ulcer pain will be worse with meals um, and duodenal ulcer um, pain is worse when the patient's hungry. So if you just think about it, when you eat food, um, that's going to be sort of secreting acid into the stomach. That's going to make the gastric ulcer worse. Um, does that make sense? Cool. Um, all right. Can anyone name some complications of peptic ulcer disease? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. 
So the big one to worry about, obviously, is perforation. I should include iron deficiency anemia, but, it, but that's a good one to consider as well. Um, and duodenal ulcers perforate more commonly than gastric ulcers. You can also get um, gastric outlet obstruction, um, hemorrhage, so melina, hematemesis, hypertension, blood loss, anemia, probably included in there. Gastric multilymphoma, have you guys heard of this? If you haven't done it, you'll do it in your pathology lectures. It's a type of cancer that occurs as a complication of H. pylori. And it's actually a really interesting cancer because if you treat the H. pylori, the cancer more often than not goes away. So probably one of the nicest cancers to treat. Um, and pancreatides as well. So also know the difference between duodenal ulcers and gastric ulcers. They have different arteries that are sort of connected to them when they perforate. Do you guys know what they are? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Easy to remember because duodenal is gastroduodenal. Um, okay, so we'll move on to the biliary system. Often the hardest part about the biliary system is learning the different terminology because all the words kind of sound exactly the same. They're only slightly different. So we'll just go through so you can crystallize in your head what the different words mean. <coughs> So biliary colic, um, the gallbladder contracts and pushes stones into the cystic duct. When the duct relaxes, the stone rolls back into the gallbladder. There's no infection. Um, it's also a misnomer. So don't think of biliary colic in the same way you think of renal colic occurring in that sort of um, minutes crescendo, decrescendo pattern. Biliary colic can happen crescendo, decrescendo, but it typically lasts hours, not minutes. It's not a, you know, hurts for two minutes, then it goes away. Um, and it also has a relationship to fatty food as well. Sometimes patients will say it's worse after they eat a cheeseburger. Um, cholelithiasis, presence of gallstones in the gallbladder. Cholecystitis, itis inflammation, so inflammation of the gallbladder. Cholidocolithiasis, gallstones in the common bile duct. And cholangitis is itis again, um, infection, <coughs> inflammation of the biliary tree. Um, all right, acute cholecystitis is sort of bread and butter of upper GI, know it well, easily examinable, good OSCE station, good multiple choice question, um, good thing to know on the wards. Um, the five Fs of a, col a typical cholecystitis patient, obviously it's not like this in real life, but 40s, female, fat, fair and fertile. Um, clinical features ask about a past history of biliary colic, but they might have severe constant epigastric pain or right upper quadrant pain, worse with meals. They might have anorexia, nausea, vomiting, low grade fever, um, may have Murphy sign positive. So, does anyone know what Murphy sign is? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. And Boaz sign. So it's right subscapular pain that sometimes patients can get. Um, and does anyone know why patients get right subscapular pain sometimes with abdominal pathology? Yeah, it irritates the diaphragm. So C3, 4, 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. Um, and that's phrenic nerve. And it's often irritated. Also, uh, commonly after patients get appendicitis um, and they get laparoscopic surgery, they complain of shoulder pain that's almost worse sometimes than the abdominal pain. And that's because there's irritation of the diaphragm with the surgery. Um, so investigations, look for an elevated white cell count left shift. You might have elevated bilirubin. If they're febrile and you're wondering if they're septic, you'll do blood cultures. And ultrasound is really the, the one thing you need to do. It's 98% sensitive. Um, management, know a little bit about. So baseline, you admit them, hydrate them, IV access, two large bore cannulas, um, nil per hourly if you're going to take them to surgery. The three A's in any sort of acute abdomen, consider analgesia, antiemetics and antibiotics. Um, you do need to know the pre-op antibiotics. So kefazolin if it's uncomplicated. Um, and cholecystectomies are interesting because there's sort of two time frames when you'll do it. Some surgeons like to operate as soon as the patient comes in, so within 72 hours. And some surgeons like to wait about six weeks for inflammation to sort of resolve and then they'll operate. So there's pros and cons for both and it really depends on the individual surgeon and their preference as to whether they'll operate on a patient straight away or operate six weeks down the track. Um, also something called acalculus cholecystitis, so cholecystitis in the absence of gallstones. Um, risk factors, diabetes, immunosuppression, ICU admission, TPN, really big one. I actually saw two patients who had um, acalculus cholecystitis last year as a result of their TPN. 
Um, and it comprises 20% of cholecystitis, supposedly. So not, not insignificant amount. Um, and total parental nutrition. So patients might be connected to sort of, often patients with like short gut or have serious abdominal pathology and they can't tolerate oral foods. Um, so surgical prophylaxis for abdominal surgery. Um, it's worth knowing the ETG guidelines. Typically, it's kefazole and two grams within 60 minutes of surgical incision. Um, and if there's obstruction present, you can add metronidazole. Um, you're covering for the aerobic gram negative bacilli, so E. coli and Klebsiella, um, and also some aerobic gram negative. Um, and prophylaxis is recommended for gastroduodenal or esophageal surgical procedures that enter the GI tract lumen. We don't, if you're not entering the GI tract lumen and the patient hasn't perforated or they're not at high risk of an infection, we don't routinely do antibiotic prophylaxis before surgery. But I've actually seen it come up as questions in, 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 in different places. So it is worth knowing um, what antibiotics to give in a pre-op patient. Um, okay, again, sorry for the sort of content-heavy slide, but it's worth knowing a little bit about biliary colic ascending cholangitis and cholidocolithiasis. Um, biliary colic we spoke about. You can treat with an elective cholecystectomy if you want, um, but the patients won't have signs of infection usually. They'll be afebrile. Ascending cholangitis is the one that we really worry about. It's um, obstruction of the common bile duct leading to biliary stasis, bacterial overgrowth, and biliary sepsis. So it can be caused by a lot of things, but the one that I just want to draw your attention to is post-ERCP. So um, the procedure that can be done sometimes to treat stones can also cause ascending cholangitis. So double-edged sword. Um, organisms that usually cause E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Enterococcus proteus, so your UTI type bacteria, um, and clinical Charcot's triad, Reynolds pentad. They might have nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, jaundice, shock, confusion, and fever. Cholangitis patients will be febrile, so commit that to memory. Um, and important to do blood cultures in these patients again because you want to know what organism is causing. Um, NPO, fluids, electrolyte balance, and NGT, and then you'll do IV antibiotics. So according to ETG for ascending cholangitis, you'll give gentamicin plus amoxicillin, or you'll give keftriaxone and, and or tazacin. So that's what ETG says, and I think it's pretty safe to go by what they say. Um, and cholidocolithiasis, um, again, just stones in the common bile duct, and 50% of patients are asymptomatic. They might be tender, and they might have fluctuating jaundice depending on where the stone is. It can be um, a primary stone or it can be a secondary stone, and usually it's a secondary stone formed in the gallbladder. Um, and you can treat that with ERCP. So just some quick um, multiple choice questions, some words and phrases to be aware of. post cholecystectomy syndrome happens in 20% of patients or thereabouts um, and it's presence of symptoms after a cholecystectomy. So patients will go in because they've got sort of right upper quadrant pain, it's worse with meals, they'll get an elective cholecystectomy and the pain will still be there. So you have to look for stones in the common bile duct or increased bile flow into the upper or lower GIT and it's not uncommon. I saw it quite a few patients in a post-op clinic that had post cholecystectomy syndrome. So keep an eye out for it when you're asking patients who've had a um, cholecystectomy if they're still experiencing symptoms. Um, Maritzi syndrome is extra luminal compression of the common bile duct. Not common, but again, more just sort of for, for buzzword knowledge. Um, Charcot's triad is right upper quadrant pain, jaundice and fever. Reynolds pentad, that's the one for ascending cholangitis. You just add shock um, and confusion. Gallstone um, ileus is really uncommon, but surprisingly, um, you get quizzed on it quite a bit if you do sort of gastro surgery or GI surgery at all. Um, and pretty much it's a, it's a fistula that connects to the duodenum and you get a large gallstone that enters and it usually impacts near the ileocecal valve and it causes a bowel obstruction. So sometimes you wouldn't normally draw the connection between gallstones and a bowel obstruction, but if there's a fistula that's leading into the bowel, you can get a bowel obstruction if there's a stone there. Um, and Corvazier's sign, really important. It's a palpably enlarged gallbladder um, that's painless um, and jaundice. So in that patient, you'd actually be thinking not gallstones because it's painless and you'd be worried about cancer. So pancreatic cancer or cholangiocarcinoma. 
Um, and just again, some ultrasound signs. You might get probe tenderness, which is in a way conceptually similar to Murphy's sign when you carry some inflamed gallbladder will hurt. Um, distended gallbladder with thickened walls, so greater than four millimetres, um, and you might see impacted stones. Any questions so far? Cool. We'll move on to liver disease. Um, just know some basic facts about the liver, what the liver does. So does anyone want to tell me some functions of the liver? It's written up here, so it's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Albumin and clotting factors. <laughs> yep, exactly. But, yep. Yeah, drug metabolism. Definitely, big one. Um, well, we spoke about the hepatic vein, uh, the portal vein, sorry, in the hepatic artery before, so we won't labour that point too much. But um, just keep in mind some of the functions of the liver while we talk about some liver pathology because it will come up when we talk about why we get different clinical signs when we examine a patient with liver disease. So LFT interpretation is one of those things that's really difficult to get your head around at first, um, but it's really important because it's really examinable in OSCEs potentially, or it's also really examinable in multiple choice questions. And it's really clinically relevant because if you have a patient with liver disease, you need to know how to interpret their liver function test. So the main things that you need to know with the LFT interpretation is um, AST, ALT, ALP, and GGT. So AST is released in serum in proportion to cellular damage to the liver, but it's also found in cardiac and skeletal muscles. <coughs> ALT is found mainly in liver cells. It's more specific. So I remember L for liver. L is going to be the most specific for liver damage. ALP um, is produced by the bile canaliculi, but it's also produced by the bone, the placenta, and the small intestine. So you can get an increased um, ALP in pregnancy. You can get an increased ALP in bone disease, particularly Paget's disease, um, and in malignancy as well, the ALP can go up. Um, GGT is the alcohol one. It's the one we classically think of in an alcoholic. Um, produced by renal tubules, liver, biliary tract, pancreas, heart, brain, and testes. So also um, you can get a GGT rise post AMI. There's a couple of drugs that can cause a GGT rise and pancreatitis can cause a GGT rise. So don't automatically assume that it's an alcoholic just because you see an elevated GGT. Um, and here are the different patterns. So depending on the rise and how much they rise and what's rising, that's going to give you an indication roughly of what type of liver pathology you're thinking. So if you get an isolated elevation in bilirubin, you're probably thinking something along the lines of hemolysis or you're thinking a genetic syndrome. So the one you'll probably get is Gilbert syndrome. That's the more common one to come up. If you get the ALP and GGT rise, that's what we call a cholestatic pattern. So think of a bile duct bile duct obstruction, so think of stones or tumour, something compressing the bile duct, um, or damage to the bile duct in primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. If you don't know what they are yet, don't panic. You'll get them covered in your pathology lectures. So um, that's not too much of an issue. AST and ALT, uh, that's what we're going to be associating mainly with liver damage. Um, if you get an acute and a massive increase, you want to think of something that's really damaging the liver. You want to think of an acute viral hepatitis, drugs, toxics. Those are magic mushrooms, not like normal mushrooms that we'd eat. Um, or autoimmune hepatitis can cause a massive and acute increase. Um, and mild and chronic increase things of, I just think of things that are a little bit more mild. So chronic viral hepatitis, alcohol, fatty liver disease or drugs. Not a hard and fast rule, but just for a basic rule of thumb. And also have a look at the AST-ALT ratio. So in most of the time in a hepatocellular injury, the AST will be lower than the ALT. But if we have an AST-ALT ratio of 2 to 1, we think of alcoholic liver disease or cirrhosis. Um, okay, hepatic examination, super important um, and super relevant. We look for lots of different things. We look for jaundice, abdominal distinction, hepatic flap. Um, we want to do proper OBS, make sure they're not febrile. We want to do postural hypertension or look for an elevated blood pressure. We look for pruritus, asterisks, the, the list you can read. But what I want you to do is think of the different things that the liver does and then think about why you're going to get the different clinical signs. So first thing that the liver does is it's involved in estrogen metabolism. So if we have a problem with estrogen metabolism, what clinical signs will we see? Yep, gynecomastia. 
spider nevi. Perfect. You can also get a bit of um, hair loss on the chest sometimes. Um, if we have a deficiency in albumin and clotting factors, what what might miss? What might we see? Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. If we have an increase in bilirubin, what what sign would correlate with that? Jaundice. Yep, sclerolicterus. Um, and if we have an elevated portal venous pressure, um, what what other signs might we see? Uh, yes, actually, yes. Yes, well, ascites actually is more complicated than just hypoalbuminemia. The real pathology of ascites does have some relationship with electrolyte balance um, and portal hypertension, but the rule of thumb that we think about as third years is just um, sort of decreased albumin, but it is more complicated than that. So you're right in mentioning that it does have something to do with portal hypertension. But the one that I was thinking about was um, varices or dilated veins, and we talk about the three places. The one that you'll see most likely um, is the descended veins on the abdomen. Does anyone know the sign, the name for that sign? Yeah, caput medusa. Exactly. Um, okay, so we'll talk about acute liver failure. It was one of those things that was always hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, it took me a long time to understand what acute liver failure really is. The three cardinal signs that you have to know about is it's characterised by a rapid decline in hepatic function. Um, with jaundice, coagulopathy and hepatic encephalopathy in patients with no prior history of liver disease. So that's the overarching definition of acute liver failure. Usually it's going to be caused by paracetamol toxicity in 46% of cases, but um, you want to rule out other reasons why you can get acute liver failure. So um, hepatitis, drug-induced liver failure, alcoholic hepatitis, Wilson's disease, but Chiari, and the list goes on. Um, risk factors obviously depends on what type or what the etiology is, but alcoholics over 40s, apparently female, I'm not sure if that's necessarily true, but pregnancy, paracetamol use, hepatitis and travel, travel again related with hepatitis. Um, general symptoms of liver failure, you'll get anorexia, fatigue, malaise, nausea, vomiting. You might get the more hepatic signs stuff that we spoke about on examination in the previous slide. And hepatic encephalopathy. So does someone want to talk me through why we get hepatic encephalopathy or, or what even is hepatic encephalopathy? Exactly. That's exactly what it is to do. Um, there's a problem with metabolizing ammonia. We get a buildup of ammonia and we get sort of um, the signs here, mild, anything from sleep reversal, lack of awareness, short attention span, to the more severe neurological signs. So confusion, disorientation, hyperreflexia, nystagmus, cloning, rigidity, clonus, sorry, rigidity. Um, that's, a, that's on the severe end of the hepatic encephalopathy spectrum. Alcoholic liver disease, again, is one of those things that's really well covered in your pathology lecture. But the concept that it's important to sort of wrap your head around now is that it's a spectrum. Um, it's not you go straight from drinking alcohol to cirrhosis. There's steps in between. Um, there's excess alcohol intake that can lead to fatty liver, which is reversible if you abstain from alcohol. Um, if you keep on going, you might get alcoholic hepatitis, which is possibly reversible. And if you keep on going again, that can lead to alcoholic cirrhosis. But you have to be drinking for quite a number of years and, and quite a significant amount of alcohol before you get cirrhosis. So you're not really going to see an 18-year-old who's been drinking for two years at a party developing cirrhosis. There's a couple of stages in between. Um, just going to draw your attention to Mallory hyaline. That's a feature of alcoholic um, steatohepatitis. And there's also a difference between macronodular and micronodular cirrhosis. So depending on the sort of size of the, depending on the size of, of like the fibrosis and, and the bands and where they are and how big, if you can see sort of those circles, how big they are. Um, you can get an indication of what the etiology is. But again, you'll cover this in pathology, so don't stress about this too much. Um, just the definition of cirrhosis. It's a generalised diffuse alteration of the liver with replacement of normal liver tissue by scar tissue. Not all cirrhosis progresses to end-stage liver disease and not all end-stage liver disease is caused by cirrhosis. And there's two types of cirrhosis. There's compensated and decompensated. So compensated is when you're going to be asymptomatic. Decompensated is when you get complications present. And those are some of the causes. 
So does anyone want to tell me some reasons why we might become decompensated? What, what's going to tip somebody to that stage? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, definitely. Um, alcohol, uh, yeah, definitely. Okay, so those are all really good answers. Anything that's going to damage the liver, so development of portal vein thrombosis, <coughs> hepatocellular carcinoma, any infection, so spontaneous, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Do you want to explain to us what spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is? Like infection of the Yeah. Yeah, essentially, that's exactly what it is. Pneumonia, sepsis, anything that's obviously going to tip the body into a more stressed state. Um, medication is a really big one. Um, you don't want somebody with cirrhosis to be overdosing on Panadol because it's not going to be good for their liver. But also alcohol, benzos, opioids, methotrexate, amiodarone, augmentin, and the list goes on. Bleeding. So any sort of varices, GI bleeds, intracranial hemorrhage, um, causes stress on the body and can tip somebody to a decompensated state and again anything that causes severe stress on the body so i just think of the failures heart failure um kidney failure or lung res respiratory failure um and here's some complications so know these back to front ascites which um is as we spoke about before related to hypoalbuminemia um, and you can treat it with paracentesis salt restriction and a diuretic um, varices we spoke about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis consider prophylaxis it's so common in patients with ascites to get SBP so sometimes we can give them Bactrim as prophylaxis um, hepatic encephalopathy we spoke about we treat with lactulose decreases the absorption of ammonia in the gut you wouldn't normally think of lactulose as um, a treatment for hepatic encephalopathy but it's a good thing to know um, hepatocellular carcinoma and hepatorenal syndrome. So hepatorenal syndrome is when there's a deterioration in kidney function in patients with cirrhosis um, or acute liver failure. We don't 100% know why it occurs, but look out for it in patients with um, kidney patients with kidney failure and liver failure. Um, all right, in the interest of time, we'll sort of go a little bit quicker through the next part of the lecture. Hepatitis A and E, hepatitis is... Um, Hepatitis A is fecal oral root and so is hepatitis E. That's why I group them together. Um, they, they're usually good because they rarely progress to fulminant hepatitis. The only thing you need to know is with hepatitis E, there's elevated mortality in pregnancy. So there's a 20% risk of fulminant liver failure if a woman's pregnant and contracts hepatitis E. Hep B is the one you need to know most about. It's a DNA virus, um, vertical transmission, so 95% if the patient's got active virus. Um, also blood borne or so needles, sexual transmission, and we can prevent with a vaccine. Um, when we talk about the hepatitis B serology, it's important to know that there's um, antigens on the surface and there's an envelope and there's a core. Um, just general liver function test serologies for diagnosis, but we also do LFTs, FBE, COAG, um, and prognosis, 20% of cases will become chronic. Management of Hep B, just um, not, not so crucial to know, but a good slide to refer back to if you're brushing up before your OSCEs. Um, we'll treat, you treat um, only when they get their HBV DNA levels to a particular level or if they have um, ALT rise. You don't treat necessarily all patients with Hep B from the beginning. Um, hepatitis serology, that's sort of the typical thing that a lot of people struggle with. Um, there's lots of different things that you could get, lots of different possibilities and combinations, and you have to determine is the patient vaccinated, do they have an active infection, do they have a chronic infection, do they have immunity to it, and depending on the different serology, that's going to give you a clue to what's going on. So the key thing to know, um, the really important thing to wrap your head around, is that when you give somebody a vaccine, you're giving them the surface antigen. Or you're not giving them the core antigen, you're not giving them the envelope antigen, you're just giving them the surface antigen. So if there's core... Um, if they're core antigen positive or envelope antigen positive, it's not from a vaccine. And they'll develop antibodies, obviously, to the surface antigen, not to the other ones. Um, you can read through this slide, but um, the hepatitis A serology is pretty easy, just IgM and IgG, M for immediate. So that's what's going to happen immediately. And G is sort of the longer term lasting immunity. Um, surface antigen, uh, can, can indicate infection but can also indicate immunisation, core antigen, 
Um, is when you get the IgM and the IgG, again, think of it similarly, IgM is immediate, IgG means it's been there for a bit longer. And envelope is an indication of viral uh, transmissibility. So if you have um, hep B envelope antigen, it indicates that there's active viral replication. Um, and if you have antibodies against that, then it's probably going to be a low, it's probably going to have a low level of transmissibility. So that table came out a little bit blurry, but that's just some examples of the different patterns you'll get um, depending on what's going on. Uh, four stages of hepatitis. Uh, I won't go through this, but you can have a look at this in your own time. Just immune tolerance, immune clearance, immune control, and immune escape. Um, hep C is the one that's more common in sort of the IVDU population. Highly, uh, primarily bl blood transmission, so post-transfusion, sexually transmitted, and you can be a carrier of hep C. Um, there's an IL-288 genotype that doesn't, isn't really usually assessed, but it can sort of predict pre response to treatment for hep C. And the reason, the one thing I just want to draw your attention to is we have a really new, a really good new treatment for hep C. Um, typically, hep C was something that wasn't really curable. It would grumble on for a long time, and it caused a lot of morbidity and mortality. Now we've got a treatment um, that can cure 90 to 95% of patients within 8 to 12 weeks um, and it's available on the, PPS, on the PBS. So there's been this huge sort of shift in how we treat hepatitis C. It's no longer a death sentence like it once was. Um, just some memory tricks for hepatitis A for acute and alone, so there's no carriers. B for blood, baby making and birthing. C for chronic cirrhosis carcinoma carrier. D is defective virus dependent on HBV, so it's a super infection with a poor prognosis. Hep E is expectant mothers and epidemic and the vowels hit your bowels. So hepatitis A and E are going to be the ones that are fecal oral. Um, child Pew score, another thing to know, very easily examinable. Um, your liver specialists will almost certainly ask you if you know what is made up, what makes up the child Pew score. Um, you won't have to remember how much each point is worth and that kind of thing, but roughly know that there are three grades. You can be grade A, grade B, grade C. Um, grade A is obviously the best. Um, prognosis one year survival close to 100% um, and grade C has got a really poor prognosis. So I saw a woman with a child pew score, she was 25, um, she had grade C and she was the colour of a Simpsons character um, and it can be quite confronting sometimes to see how badly a patient with serious liver disease looks. Um, does anyone know which patients or which grade you'd be most likely to give a liver transplant to? C. Good thought. B. Yeah, it's actually B. Um, and the reason why is we unfortunately do a bit of a cost-benefit analysis. So we want to give the liver to the patient who's going to get the most life out of it. So it's almost a balance between the patients who are, who are sick but well enough to be able to tolerate a liver transplant. So child pew score <coughs> B are the ones that we typically give the liver transplants to. Um, all right, we'll move on to OSCEs. So outside the door of every OSCE, there's four questions that I ask myself. Number one, what's my diagnostic framework? So how am I going to be thinking about coming up with a list of differentials? So when you get to an OSCE session, you're probably going to get at some stage a presenting complaint. And if you think of a presenting complaint and you just try and randomly pick the diagnoses, in the stress of an OSCE, you're going to miss stuff. You're going to miss important things. You're going to miss lots of things because you'll be stressed and you and, and you and, and you won't have a formula. So we'll talk about some approaches to thinking about differentials. The next thing I think about is what's the diagnosis likely to be? Um, what's going to kill my patient? What do I need to make sure that I ask about so I don't fail my OSCE station? And what am I likely to miss? So um, first OSCE station, you're an intern at MMC ED. Craig Thomas is a 59-year-old taxi driver. Um, and he comes to you with difficulty swallowing. Please take a history. Um, I'll give you guys 30 seconds or so to come up with how you're going to approach listing differentials for difficulty swallowing.
Okay, does anyone want to shout out some ideas for what this patient might be suffering from? There's no wrong answer. <laughs> yeah, good. Yep. Yeah, good one. Yeah, that's a really good one to think about, really important. Does anyone have a particular way that they like to think of differential diagnoses? If you get a common presenting complaint, do you guys have a, a, a way in your head? Yeah, that's one of them. There's two things, or there's a couple of different um, ways to approach differential diagnoses. In, in fourth year, you'll learn the Murtars model that's used in GP. But um, fifth, third year, there's two ways that I sometimes use. One of them was a surgical sieve, like um, vitamin D, Invited, Vindicate, those kind of things, um, which we'll go through in a second. And that's sort of, it's, you know, immune, neoplastic, vascular, and all the others, and you tick off, you think, what's, what's an immune cause of difficulty swallowing? What's a vascular cause? That kind of stuff. Um, the other thing to think about is anatomy, a systems-based approach. So particularly in acute abdomen, which um, Connie will be covering in the lower GIT lecture, you think about what's going on in the region that's going to be causing problems. So with dysphagia, I do this one particularly. I think about what exactly is the problem. Can they initiate swallowing? If they can't initiate swallowing, I'm wondering about something neurological. I want to make sure it's not Parkinson's, it's not a stroke, it's not MS, and it's not um, a cranial nerve lesion. If they've got problems with solid food, I'm wondering about a mechanical problem, something that's stopping food from getting down. So carcinoma. Peptic stricture, foreign body, or um, something compressing the esophagus. So an apical lung tumour, an apical lung, a thyroid cancer, a lymphoma, something that's stopping food from getting down. Um, if they can't swallow liquid or solid, I'm, I'm thinking something sort of serious is going on and something that's really constricting the lumen of the esophagus um, quite diffusely. So scleroderma, diffuse esophageal spasm, or achalasia. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, next OSCE station, 4 a.m. in the ED in Maroondah, an ambulance brings in Chris Tucker, a 52-year-old used car salesman who appears to be intoxicated. Used car salesmen do crop up in multiple choice questions, and the answer is usually related to alcohol for some <laughs> reason. Um, whilst he's in the waiting room, he vomits blood, and he's immediately placed in, the, in resource. Please take a history um, and the your differential. So hematemesis. Um, I'll give you guys 20 seconds now to write a quick list of things that are going to cause hematemesis. <coughs> All right, anyone want to shout out some, no, don't look at that. Anyone want to shout out some causes for hematemesis? Yeah, great, Mallory Weiss here. Yeah, definitely, ruptured varices. Gastric ulcer. Gastritis, yep, exactly. Definitely, definitely. Um, okay, so I think about, Two things, esophagus and gastric, roughly. So esophageal things that are going to cause bleeding, um, esophagitis, varices, Mario-Weiss tear, esophageal perforation. And the last one's really important. It's a perforation of the esophagus. It's, a, it's, it's something that can kill you. Um, one of the things, it's not commonly spoken about, but it's one of the things that you need to rule out in any patient that doesn't always have hematemesis, but in any patient with sort of vomiting and chest pain, make sure that there's not a perforation of the esophagus. Gastric is peptic ulcer, gastric cancer or gastritis. And also in anything in any station where there's bleeding, no matter where the bleedings come from, um, think of things that are going to cause bleeding in patients. So an AV malformation or an aorta enteric fistula, so if there's some of, or general things, if they're on anticoagulation or they have some other clotting disorder or, or things that might cause 
bleeding systemically in a patient. This obviously isn't an exhaustive list. Um, I have a question about that. In terms of the soft gel preparation, what could you ask to exclude that? Yeah, so the thing is, it's highly unlikely you're going to get that as an ICU station. Um, and usually you have to do some sort of investigations to rule that out. But typically, if they've got really severe chest pain and they're vomiting a lot, um, it's one thing to keep, keep in the back of your mind. I'm not sure if you can completely 100% diagnose it without doing any investigations because a lot of things can sound similar in that region. Um, the main thing is just keep it in the back of your mind for things to spit out in differentials. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be the answer because it's not something commonly um, taught in medical school. Or well, I found that it wasn't mentioned that much. Um, know how to manage hematemesis. So I know that third year is predominantly about investigations and diagnosis. It's not really about management, but they do expect you to know how to manage things that are going to kill a patient. So they expect you to at least know how to manage really key important things like status epilepticus or know how to manage an AMI, know how to manage an appendicitis, know how to manage hematemesis because it's a really important thing that can be life-threatening for a patient. So just have a general approach to management of emergencies. Always mention Dr. ABC no matter what. There's often a mark for that. Bedsides, um, you can give them oxygen if they're hypoxic, do an ECG and a blood sugar level. So when you're thinking about management or investigations or something, particularly investigations, think about what am I going to do by the bedside? What are my bloods going to be? What are my imaging's going to be? What's my pathology if I need it and other? So if you always start with bedsides, things like blood sugar levels, pregnancy tests, urine dipstick, ECG, spirometry, Always have that in your mind when you're talking about investigations or the beginning of management of an emergency and, and use that framework every time. Bedside, bloods, imaging, other, or whatever your particular framework is. Um, and then if you're managing someone who's bleeding, it's really good to say, I would want to put in two large bore IV cannulas, um, do an FBE, blood cultures, INR, group and hold, especially because they're bleeding, UEC, liver enzymes, fluid resuscitation if they're hypertensive, so I'd want to give them two litres of normal saline. When to transfuse blood is really controversial. As a general rule of thumb, you can think of a haemoglobin less than seven, but as a junior doctor or a medical student, you might not be making the call when to transfuse a patient because there are sort of difficult guidelines as to when you would transfuse and when you wouldn't. Um, and make sure patients NPO, acid suppression, imaging, endoscopy, and always monitor their output to their vital signs and stuff like that. Um, and just here is depending on what the cause of the bleeding is, that's how you'll manage it. So octreotide, oct sorry, octreotide is um, the medication that you use in varices, cirrhosis, you wanted to give antibiotic prophylaxis, anticoagulation, and so on. Um, and the last one, uh, Sandra Sully re returns from her recent holiday feeling a little unwell. She presents to you, her GP, for a checkup. You notice immediately that she appears unwell. Take an appropriate history. So I'll give you sort of 30 seconds to come up with um, a framework or some questions some differentials that you'd want to know for, for Sandra Sully. All right, anyone want to sort of shout out some causes for or how they like to think about jaundice? Extra hepatic, intra hepatic, post hepatic. Yeah, exactly. Some extra hepatic things to be hemolysis. Yep. <clears throat> Do you want to keep going because yeah. you're doing so well already? And then intra hepatic, you know, you could call hepatitis. Yep. Um, Great. Liver disease. Perfect. Uh, post hepatic, bitter obstruction. <coughs> exactly. Yeah, that's great. Um, exactly. Um, that's, and that's, that's how I think about it, pre-hepatic, intra-hepatic and post-hepatic as well. Um, pre-hepatic, things like congenital, um, G6PD, sickle cell thalassemia, acquired, um, heart valve, DIC, malaria, don't forget malaria, um, and extravascular, so things like um, hereditary spherocytosis. And the intrahepatic, what's going to cause jaundice in the liver, so hepatitis, alcoholic cirrhosis, um, or also impaired bilirubin conjugation or uptake. 
and post hepatic is seen sort of outside the liver generally. Um, cholelithiasis, cholangitis, um, cholangiocarcinoma, cancer of the head of the pancreas um, causing obstruction. <coughs> and there's also a, a surgical sieve here invited. So if you prefer to think of things in terms of systems, if you've really got no idea and you want to make sure you cover all your bases, I like to sometimes drop this down on, on outside each oscillation. station. So make sure I've ticked off my infective causes, my neoplastic causes, my vascular causes, immune, trauma, endocrine and drugs. Another good way to think about causes of jaundice if you um, want to make sure you've covered your bases. Um, all right, just some buzzwords. Um, Hematemesis plus alcoholic, uh, malaria release tear or varices, abdominal pain plus ascites plus hepatomegaly, it's by Chiari, right upper quadrant pain plus jaundice and fever, ascending cholangitis. Um, the rest of them you can sort of read through at your leisure. Um, corkscrew esophagitis we spoke about, um, plumber Vincent syndrome, dysphagia plus esophageal web plus glossitis. You see those kind of things, it's just sort of a um, reflexive <coughs> diagnosis. Um, and we'll just run through a couple of questions. So, 55-year-old um, man had been taking diclofenac, so an NSAID for a knee injury. He sustained two weeks ago while playing golf, presents to the ED with sudden onset of severe epigastric pain. On examination, he has a rigid abdomen. His temperature is 38. His pulse rate is 100 BPM, blood pressure 90 on 40, and an erect chest, chest X-ray is shown below. Does anybody know what the answer for this will be? Yeah, good. And how can you tell? Yeah, perfect. So they are giving it to you in history, but you don't even need to read the stem. All you need to do is look at this and see that there is gas under the diaphragm, so something has perforated. That is a surgical emergency. Um, they need to have an urgent laparotomy. So obviously read the stem, but if you ever see this chest x-ray, the patient pretty much needs surgery. Um, okay, 45-year-old FEMA presents with intermittent pain in the right upper quadrant associated with fever, chills, rigors, and notice her sclera are yellow. Feel free to shout out <coughs> the answer. Yeah, exactly. Everyone comes with cholangitis? Good. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right, I'm not going to show the answers after each question. I'll only show the answers at the end because when you do the multiple choice questions, if I give you the answers to the first one first, it cuts out two possibilities by the time you get to the third question. And it's an important skill when you get to your own multiple choice questions is you don't know that you got the first two correct. So... Um, Read through these and then I'll ask you guys what you think the answers are for the questions. Right, we'll start with the first question. The 45-year-old male with a 12-hour history of severe constant epigastric pain radiating to the back. Um, an ultrasound showing gallstones. Anyone have any idea what the answer for this would be? Yeah, pancreatitis, exactly. And the gallstones is what gives it away. But the severe constant epigastric pain radiating to the back, pathognomonic for acute pancreatitis. can be other things, but you're thinking more pancreatitis because of the gallstones. Are we okay with that one? Cool. Next one, 77-year-old male from nursing home with vague colicky abdominal pain. This question is, is a little bit interesting. Um, Descendant tympanic abdomen, non-tender, no mass is palpable. What do you guys think this one is? Large bowel obstruction, yeah. I actually spoke to a, um, one, of the cons one of the ED consultants about this question and she said that you're not really going to get a patient with a large bowel obstruction who's non-tender. Most patients will be tender. But I think for the purpose of this question, the answer is a large bowel obstruction. Um, and the last one, 32-year-old female with two-day with two history of right upper quadrant pain, vomiting, 
Um, key thing here, exacerbated by ingestion of food, sweats in bed at night, general malaise. What are we thinking for this one? Yes. There we go. So acute pancreatitis, large bowel obstruction, acute cholecystitis. Perfect. 25-year-old um, man, severe retrosternal chest pain, blood streaked <coughs> vomiting, course of antibiotics. Who can guess what this is? Someone mentioned it before when we were talking about some of the esophageal conditions. No, so this is an eosinophilic esophagitis, but isn't it philic esophagitis is typically um, characterised patients get food bolus um, and it's, you know, sort of associated. Often you'll see it in people who have a history of allergy or ATP, things like that. This one, the thing that gives it away is tetracycline, which is an antibiotic that can cause esophagitis. And that's the blood streaked vomiting following a course of antibiotics. Um, okay, I put this question in here because this has caused a lot of controversy. Um, most people don't agree on the answer of this question. Um, and I actually don't know the objective right answer from the faculty. But have a read through it and we can discuss through why pet people think one answer versus another. So 67-year-old retired man, heavy smoker, dull epigastric pain radiating through to the back, past history of coronary artery bypass graft, um, non-drinker. Examination of the abdomen is hampered because of marked obesity. Suspicion of fullness in the epigastrium. Um, DRE shows slightly enlarged prostate. What would you guys think? Anyone want to take a guess? I'm not actually 100% sure. Small bowel obstruction, okay. Um, I'm not actually 100% sure what the faculty released answer is, but anyone else have a different opinion, not small bowel obstruction? Carcinoma of the stomach. Carcinoma of the stomach. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, the answer that was put by, um, this, there's a Google Doc where all the students sort of write what they think the right answer is. The answer that was overwhelmingly um, picked by students is aortic aneurysm. Now, people <coughs> picked this because um, an aortic aneurysm can cause a dull epigastric pain that radiates through the back. He's got a past history of coronary artery bypass grafting, so we know he's got some sort of vascular process going on. He's a non-drinker, so it sounds like they're trying to move you away from pancreatitis into something more vascular. Now, and the suspicion of fullness in the epigastrium, if you've ever felt a triple A, um, it, it's quite large. Now, the reason why this is a bit strange, firstly, is because I don't know why a triple A would come on with acute pain if it's not, you know, if it's not ruptured, they're not hypertensive, what sort of changed, if it's been there chronically, why is it becoming painful right now? That's the question I'm asking myself. The other thing is, if he's got marked obesity, there is almost no chance you're going to feel a triple A. I mean, it's hard enough to feel in somebody who's thin, but somebody with marked obesity, I, I, I'm really not sure how you'd feel a triple A. So this question, I'm not sure the answer to. I think a lot of students have said, aortic aneurysm, given the um, fullness, the mention of fullness in the epigastrium, given the bypass grafting and given the fact that he's a non-drinker, but I can't tell you the objective faculty answer to this one. Um, almost at the end, so just a couple more questions. 76-year-old um, woman with fatigue, no additional complaints, physical examination unremarkable. Um, she has a microcytic anemia with a low ferritin. This one's a bit of a tricky one. Does anyone want to hazard a guess? Crohn's. Crohn's, good guess. Sure. Sorry? Sorry. Sorry. Celiac, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess the osteopenia, something to draw your attention to. Um, and <coughs> the sort of anemia of chronic disease can be a microcytic hypochronic anemia. Um, the second one, 70 year old man, 
Many symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease, obese, um, metabolic history, uh, metabolic syndrome, and history of smoking. Do you want to know the answer? He's had many years of reflux. He's had reflux for a long time. Okay. Barrett's, yeah, perfect. Celiac disease and Barrett's. Um, all right, almost, almost at the end. Again, I'm not going to show the answers one at a time because then you'll rule out half the answers by the time we get to the last one. So we'll go through these together. 21-year-old student, cramping, diffuse abdominal pain with alternating constipation, diarrhea, investigations normal. Key thinky that investigations are normal. Anyone want to guess what this is? IVS, yep. Irritable bowel syndrome. It's It's... It's kind of a di yeah, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We haven't found anything wrong, but you've got symptoms of constipation, diarrhea, that kind of thing. So we give you a diagnosis of IBS. 55-year-old um, smoker, severe epigastric pain, air under the diaphragm. Perforated duodenal ulcer, easy diagnosis. Nine-year-old with fever, nausea, and right iliac fossa pain. Um, says the pain was around my belly button before. It's not trying to trick you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can process that if you need to. Um, 35 year old man, weight loss, diarrhea, abdominal pain, ulcers in the mouth, mouth mass palpable in the right iliac fossa, low serum B12 and folate. Classic Crohn's. A 45 year old woman on treatment with TB. Um, with abdominal pain, malaise, and jaundice. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Exactly. Hepatitis. Um, and the last page, we'll go through these really quickly. Um, a hard 69 year old retired bricklayer, weight loss, fever, right upper quadrant pain on examination, um, hard irregular liver, serum AFP. Uh, freak. Yeah, exactly. AFP is what's going to be elevated in HCC. Um, with all those cancer markers, they're, they're not for screening. They're only for tracking treatment. You never do them to, to, to diagnose it. You do it to measure their response to treatment. Very controversial to use something like that in diagnosis. 45-year-old man with arthralgia, tiredness and development of diabetes. Um, I'll give you a clue. Skin's pig pigmented, so it's bronze, let's say. Hemochromatosis, yeah. 60-year-old published presents with signs of spider knee, vagynecomastia, um, clubbing, leukemia. Anyone guess this one? Yeah. Um, yeah. 20-year-old man, history of liver problems, um, slit air in the past presents with tremor, dysarthria, and developing dyspanesia. Slit lamp reveals greenish-brown ring at cornea spiral junction. <laughs> Yeah, and do you know what they're called? Yeah, Kaiser Fletcher. Yeah, and 50-year-old man presents with signs of chronic liver disease and history of early onset pulmonary emphysema, non-smoker. So pulmonary emphysema in a non-smoker. And he's also got liver problems. Oh, he's got A1 antitrypsin. He's got alpha-1 antitrypsin. Whenever you see liver and lung in a non-smoker and you'll learn about pathology, the difference between um, the pathology like panacinone and but it, where, where the emphysema is, and that'll give you a clue. If it's everywhere, it's emphysema. If it's just at sort of the beginning, it's smoking. But you'll see that when you do pathology. Um, okay, so that's upper GI for you guys. If you have any questions, feel free to stay back or email me. But, yeah, good luck for the rest of the GI. Right there. Um, I'll get the same. <laughs>